No Room for a Leopard I first saw the leopard when I was crossing the small stream at the bottom of the hill. The ravine was so deep that for most of the day it remained in shadow. This encouraged many birds and animals to emerge from cover during the hours of daylight. Very few people ever passed that way. As a result, the ravine had become a little haven for wildlife. Below my cottage was a forest of oak and maple and Himalayan rhododendron. A narrow path twisted its way down through the trees. At the bottom of the hill, a path led onto a grassy verge surrounded by wild dog roses. The streams ran close by the verge, tumbling over smooth pebbles. Nearly every morning, I heard the cry of the barking deer. I saw pine martens and handsome red fox. I recognized the footprints of a bear. As I had not come to take anything from the jungle, the birds and animals soon grew accustomed to my face. After some time, my approach did not disturb them. The langurs in the oak and rhododendron trees, who at first would go leaping through the branches at my approach, now watched me with some curiosity as they munched up the tender green shoots of the oak. However, one evening, as I passed, I heard them chattering in the trees, and I was not the cause of their excitement. It was as though the langurs were trying to warn me of some hidden danger. A shower of pebbles came rattling down the steep hillside. I looked up to see an orange-gold leopard poised on a rock about twenty feet above me. It was not looking towards me, but had its head thrust attentively forward in the direction of the ravine. It must have sensed my presence because it slowly turned its head and looked down at me. It seemed a little puzzled at my presence there. Then, to give myself courage, I clapped my hands sharply. The leopard sprang away into the thickets, making absolutely no sound. I had disturbed the animal in its quest for food. But a little later I heard the quickening cry of a barking deer as it fled through the forest. The hunt was still on. The leopard, like other members of the cat family, is nearing extinction in India, and I was surprised to find one so close to Masuri. Probably the deforestation that had been taking place in the surrounding hills had driven the deer into this green valley. It was some weeks before I saw the leopard again, although I was often made aware of its presence. At times I felt certain that I was being followed. Once, when I was late getting home, I saw two bright eyes staring at me from a thicket. I stood still, my heart banging away against my ribs. Then the eyes danced away, and I realized they were only fireflies. In May and June, when the hills were brown and dry. It was always cool and green near the stream where ferns and long grasses continued to thrive. One day I found the remains of a barking deer that had been partially eaten. I wondered why the leopard had not hidden the remains of his meal. Probably he had been disturbed while eating. Climbing the hill I met a party of hunters resting beneath the oaks. They asked me if I had Fewer birds to be seen, and even the langurs had moved on. I thought no more of the men. They were unpredictable and to be avoided if possible. One day, after crossing the stream, I climbed Paritibba, a bleak scrub-covered hill where no one lived. This was a stiff undertaking because there was no path to the top and I had to scramble up with the help of rocks and roots. At the top was a plateau with a few pine trees their upper branches catching the wind and humming softly. There I found the ruins of what must have been the first settlers. Just a few piles of rubble, now overgrown with weeds, sorrel, dandelion and nettles. As I walked through the roofless ruins, I was struck by the silence that surrounded me. The silence was so absolute that it seemed to be shouting in my ears. But there was something else of which I was becoming increasingly aware. The strong odour of one of the cat family. I paused and looked about. I was alone. There was no movement of dry leaf or loose stone. The ruins were, for the most part, 
open to the sky. Their rafters had collapsed and joined together to form a low passage like the entrance to a mine. This dark cavern seemed to lead down. The smell was stronger when I approached this spot. I stopped again and waited there, wondering if I had discovered the lair of the leopard. I wondered if the animal was now at rest after a night's hunt. Perhaps it was crouched there, in the dark, watching me and recognizing me as a man who walked alone in the forest without a weapon. I like to think that he was there, and that he knew me, and that he acknowledged my visit in the friendliest way, by ignoring me altogether. I did not venture any further. I did not seek physical contact, or even another glimpse of that beautiful creature springing from rock to rock. It was his trust I wanted, and I think he gave it to me. But did the leopard, trusting one man, make the mistake of trusting others? Because next day, coming from the path of the stream, shouting and beating their drums were the hunters. They had a long bamboo pole across their shoulders and strung from the pole, feet up, head down, was the lifeless body of the leopard. It had been shot in the neck and in the head. We told you there was a leopard. We told you there was a leopard, they shouted. Ha <laughs> ha, we told you there was a leopard. They shouted in great good humor. Isn't he a fine specimen? Yes. Home through the silent forest. It was very silent. Almost as though the birds and animals knew their trust had been violated. I remembered the lines of a poem by D. H. Lawrence. And as I climbed the steep and lonely path to my home, these words echoed in my mind. There was room in the world for a mountain lion and me.